you so much for coming here. This is so surreal. Um, I love Books for Magic so much. I was able to um, read there for my last book tour um, for six years ago, and I really wish I could be there. And if you haven't been to Books for Magic, please go when this is over. It's such a, like, unbelievably enchanting bookstore. It's truly magic. I love it. Um, so thank you so much. I'm excited to do the launch with Books for Magic. And I'm so excited that I got to drag Elif to do this with me <laughs> because now it's like, <laughs> I've now done this so many times that it's so generous of her to constantly like answer my emails where I'm like, please, Elif, can you just like do this? Oh, come please? on. This is the best thing that's happened to me. Definitely all quarantine. And <laughs> Um, okay, so that feels really good for me. And so I'm dragging on along all these writers I love on my entire book tour. Um, so it's just been really, really lovely. This is the first one. And then I guess we have a few more stops. So I'm going to read different essays from Brown Album each time. And um, I'm going to read an early essay, actually, that appeared in Guernica almost a decade ago. Um, but it just seems to be an essay that um, it's an essay I like to read and seems to um, do well as a, as a spoken essay. Um, it's an essay in about 11 parts. So I'll say like one, two, three, you know, tons of chunks. And um, it was actually edited by the writer Devil and Unforth, a great friend of mine for Guernica's innovative memoir issue. So it's sort of like on paper has a slightly experimental look, but um, it's pretty straightforward. And it's basically about a traumatic event of my childhood. <laughs> um, uh, basically my dad, I realize some people might not know this, but basically Iranians who came to the U.S. in the early 80s, we were often called camel jockey. And I had students who don't know the term camel jockey, actually. They didn't know that that was a common racial slur for all sorts of Middle Eastern people, actually. And so this that's a big central theme in this essay. The essay is called Camel Ride, Los Angeles, 1986. One, it had come down to this, a camel ride. It was the middle of the 80s and I was at the Los Angeles Zoo, a place I'd never been before. The air was dusty and soft celled the sky orange and cloudless. Our faces were light lavender and my hair a glossy black bowl, my body too thin and sloppily tucked into overalls. This is what the map photos tell us today. There is a picture of me attempting to embrace an all white goat in the petting zoo, another of me in front of an indifferent giraffe, and one where I'm trying to force a straw from a supersized cup into my little brother's nose, and the blurry hand at the edge is trying to stop me. It belongs to my father. There is no picture of us with the camels. That is only, only in my head where it doesn't belong either. It was our lucky day in the middle of a week, a school day our father let us get off. He was working that coming weekend, a fact we did not know. Again and again, he said it was because he loved us so much, which he reminded us of on the way there and on the way everywhere we went. We went to see the lions, which he reminded us appeared on the Iranian flag, which is still our flag, and the polar bears, which looked out of place in the sunshine. But he sure to say we're fine and told us that they loved the climate that Los Angeles and Tehran shared. We saw the monkeys who were sleeping all except one, who entertained the laughing masses by regurgitating whatever food he kept trying to eat over and over. This my father did not like. What is the meaning of this, of him? But he tolerated us standing there for our sake. There were animals we wanted to leave and animals we did not want to leave. There was one breed of animal in particular that we wanted to leave. They frolicked behind a yellow and maroon sign, a few simple words announcing conveniently a question that felt more like an interrogation who doesn't want to ride a camel. We didn't want to. My father pointed out that one camel could take all three of us. How fortunate for us. He told us we didn't have to be scared. All the other kids were loving it. We weren't scared. I wasn't scared rather, as I wasn't at all thinking about my little brother, although he was suddenly quiet enough for me to think he was with me on this one. Time started to move slowly. My vision focused on myself, my father and that camel. Something I felt had to be done to keep us from riding, from taking the camel ride. My father said, are you ready? Come on, everyone. This is what we've been waiting for. But what we've been waiting for was a place where we could be like everyone else, rid of a certain yellow and maroon script, rid of rides on the backs of things, or just the idea of rides on the backs of things. We two children stood there, frozen, shamed, butts of a cruel joke. Only I looked at my father straight in the eye, though he was already counting dollar bills, asking my mother to get in line for us. Two, 
We were only a few years into our arrival in America, a place I attempted to call home, even though my parents warned me that it was all temporary. My first memories were my last memories of Iran. First, an old man at a party with much dancing sitting with me, a relative perhaps, talking and talking and suddenly stirring his tea with his finger. The next, false air raids in the night sky of Iran, empty threats from Iraq's side, a circle of beautiful pink lights in the black night sky, a thing of beauty to me, even my mother's shaking arms. I learned English watching The Twilight Zone. I filled our quiet home with the magical incantation, you're traveling through another dimension, a dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind, a journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination. That's the signpost up ahead, your next stop, the Twilight Zone. I also learned English by imitating kids on the playground of my preschool, a Twilight Zone I was thrown into early. They said bad words, I said bad words, and I went home and repeated the bad words to my parents. Usually it was okay because they didn't know what the words meant either, but sometimes they did, and then a huge sadness would fill the room and not leave until the blabber of the TV interrupted and shook off its weight. I love this country with the lukewarm, watery, neither here nor there love that you bestow upon any country when it's the only country you know. I accepted it and never until much later considered that it might not accept me. Three, the camel has a nameplate on its blanket. The plate says its name is Shahrazad, an echo. The name of a relative of mine is Shahrazad, but I think no relation. My father, however, points it out and laughs loudly. My mother, whose relative it is, smiles weakly, more, bo more bored than anything. Where is my mother, I wonder? It's a question I often have. Where is my mother? She's off in a Sears catalog in One Life to Live, an herb and kidney bean and lamb stew for dinner tonight, in laundry and dishes. I look to my brother, who looks lost in the endless, empty fantasies of zoo life. It is clear I am alone with my concern for the situation. There is another camel named Latte and another camel named Coco, but I see Shahrazad alone, and Shahrazad alone sees us. Four. I become good at becoming one of them, for the most part. One thing I realized was that to become one of them, you couldn't just think of them as them. You had to think of them as people, which is odd and less obvious and more exhausting than it sounds. Which type of them would you like to be? Pick a role. There was the teacher's pet, the prettiest girl, the class clown, the fastest runner, the shyest kid, the genius, the most crazy. There were two roles that appealed to me, the weird one and the bad girl. I was terrifically suited for the first. My clothing style in the first grade was a compromise of dependence and independence. I wore whatever overdressed thing my mother wanted, but added a few items of my own. Those fluffy dresses she adored topped with my cowboy hat or neon soccer socks or a scarf tied around my head as a bandana. Kids always commented on how weird I looked. I started to say weird things, make jokes that made no sense even to me and noises that were otherworldly and took on a faraway look in my big, too big eyes. During recess, I drew instead of played, which was also a weird thing to do. I hung out with teachers more than other students. Weird. Even a teaching assistant called me a weirdo for tagging along with her so often. I displayed the contents of my lunches from home, a gray mottled eggplant dip that smelled like carpet, I declared, beating them to it, even though I loved few things more than cash kebab and john, and the bright yellow rice pudding with a heart and cinnamon chulazar, which I also loved and pretended was made of plastic for their sake. They wrinkled their noses and some shrieked and even moved away while I smiled. Weird, weird, weird. I was less suited for the bad girl image, but I wanted it badly. Movies told me that another way to be different was to be a villain. When it came time to try out for roles in my own elementary school's production of Dorothy and the Rainbow Connection, or more suitable for a kiddie, low-budget version of The Wizard of Oz, I knew exactly who I wanted to be. All the popular and pretty girls auditioned for Dorothy, Glenda, and even Toto, but I wanted to play the Wicked Witch of the East. My teacher looked at me amused. She told me, you're too good to be a bad witch. At best, you could be a good witch. I took this badly, as I did other experiences where adults tried to discourage me. My piano teacher, frustrated by my slow learning, said my hands were better suited for pottery. My ice skating teacher complained that I dragged my left foot oddly until she asked me to withdraw, worried I was in some kind of condition. But these were my only conditions, badness, weirdness. I tried out for the bad witch defiantly in front of my teacher, who smiled as if she had forgotten what she advised. I tried out and I failed. 
I did not get a lead, but I did get a one-liner. I played Dorothy's cousin, Lori, a made-up character who in one line was to catalog all the food they had at a particular Kansas reunion. Fried chicken, biscuits, gravy, mashed potatoes, sweet potato pie, etc. All the foods I never ate, foods that a future self might argue could, with the right lens, be seen as weird and bad. Five. Sherazade is being fed a handful of something that looks like grass. It's hard to say if latte and cocoa are given the same stuff, but one has to assume they are. One has to assume. <laughs> it will soon be over, my mother is saying with a light hand on my shoulder. Where is my mother? My mother was the one who was always home, but where was she? Why could I never get a solid grasp on her? I thought if I could only remember when she was pregnant with my brother five years ago, big like those balloon mothers with babies inside them on TV, then she'd be substantial for me. It's possible even then I'd think of her as a vessel for my little brother. She was already something of that to me when she wasn't my father's wife or my grandparents' daughter or Shahrazad and the other's cousin. When will she be my mother, I wondered. I never acted bad enough to make her mad or worry, which my father and brother seemed to do. But was I good enough for her? She tried to make cupcakes once, her first attempt. She passed the bowl of batter to me. I looked at it confused. She said, you shouldn't eat too much of this. It can make you fat. You can become like those fat Americans. I didn't eat any of it. I never became a fat American, not even as I got older. She looked down at the, pastry, at the pasty mess and sniffed it and put the bowl in the sink. Anyway, she said, Iranians can be fat too, remember. We're no better than anyone else, no matter what your dad says. Seven. Dad is saying, it is time, it is time. Who doesn't want to ride a camel indeed? He is saying that, as immigrant parents are prone to, so decorously in English, while other words casually rattling it off in Farsi. And this is the worst part for me. Everyone hears him in his accent, horribly Middle Eastern, getting excited about a camel ride. I am staying put, looking not at him, but at my mother, who looks weak and bored. She finally points at me, but it's not quite at me, I realize. It's over me. It is at him, my father. She's telling me to go to him. But my father no longer looks like my father. He looks like a Middle Eastern man I don't know. He looks like a sheikh, a terrorist, a sultan, a mullah, a dervish, a camel jockey. How do I know that term? I don't know how I know that term. Are you coming, he's saying still in English. The camel is waiting. I shake my head. Be a good girl, come on, he's saying. But I'm a bad girl, I'm the worst girl. I want nothing to do with that camel. But I don't say that, of course. But by the time he gets to me, I say what I usually say when I am in the predicament, something that is not altogether untrue. I can't, I say. I'm suddenly very sick. Help. Eight. I never needed to ask who my father was. I knew him well. He was the one of us who should have been the most worried. Jet black hair, dark brown skin, his eyes were all pupil. He looked the way the others imagined he would look. My mother had red, my mother had hair she dyed, reddish blonde and light skin to go with it. They said she looked like a non-lead actress from Dynasty, a show I didn't know then, but a name I learned mentioned around her cousins who liked to flatter her over and over, maybe in attempts to make her more present. But she was like those fair women on TV in supermarkets outside waiting for their blonde children like lemon and ice and water and snow in winter. She was barely there. My brother had her light eyes and light curls as if she had dyed it so much that the lightness took permanence in him. This will pass, they said. Young kids have lighter hair that darkens as they grow older. But when I looked at old photos of myself, my hair was black, black like my father's. The sun alone made my hair play brown. I was a lot like him, they also said. This embarrassed me. I wanted no part of him. I didn't want to be like her either. I wanted to be unlike them and everyone else too. I wanted to be the girl with no bubble beside her name, nothing to fill in. I wanted to be something altogether different, but instead I was like him. And he was unmistakable. And just as you'd imagine, he had the temper too. Everything about him was loud, even his laughter. He played native music too loudly. He prayed with all his mind. When he said my country, he did not mean this one. He was the one who told us over and over that we wouldn't be in this country for long. It took me a long time to realize that he was always, often wrong and that I shouldn't take him so seriously. But at seven, when he said, camel ride, I didn't know what my outs were. There was no reasoning with him, I thought. And so I told him 
I was sick and I thought I was sick, thought myself into being sick and I was sick. I felt sick, I was sick. He had no choice but to accept it and go ahead with the camel ride anyway, bad father of a bad girl that he was. Nine, he put a hand on my forehead and says, I feel cool. He calls my mother and she tries it too. She's okay, she says, staring off somewhere, somewhere far, far away. She hands over my brother who's smiling at the sky. Don't stare into the sun, my father reminds him. That isn't Farsi. In English, he adds, who doesn't want to ride a camel, right? My brother is in. He's fallen. There's nothing I can do. 10. I never felt any jealousy from my brother. He could have the cute, the adorable, the sweet, the good. At four, he knew how to hug and kiss everyone. He said, I love you like it was another nursery rhyme. He had a monopoly over things I didn't want, the good and the normal. Our worlds rarely intersected. I read to him while he played with toy trucks. When he cried for a toy at the drugstore, I pretended he didn't exist. Once or twice I was asked to watch him when my mother went out when my, when my dad was working and it was too much like nothing. Neither he nor I were ever in danger when we were alone. But we were sometimes in danger when they were with us. With my mother, because she was never really there with my father because of things like this, how things come down to things like this. 11, final section. His hand, big and sweaty, is around my wrist. His other arm is around my brother. My mother is behind us, waiting, waving, even as she looks down at the pavement. I don't know if I'm doing it on purpose, breathing loudly to remind him he's being negligent of a sick daughter, or if I'm actually gasping for air, sick as I am. We're second in line, second and last. The line ends with us. It is, as I suspected, not popular at the moment for anyone to ride camels. My father finally notices my upset. What's wrong, liver, he says, except liver in Farsi means deer. Why so sad? This is a great opportunity, so much fun, he says. I look down and put my hand over my heart. It is not exaggerated. My heart is actually pounding as if it's knocking against my chest. Let me out of here, it says. I just don't want to ride the camel, I say, and I'm sick. My father laughs too loudly. You are afraid, is that it? There's nothing to be afraid of. I shake my head. Then what is it? You're not sick, trust me. What can I say? I would say, Father, I don't want to be taken for what I inevitably think others will take this as, as a group of Middle Easterners here, and just a few years after these guys were selling fuck Iran buttons in supermarkets, something I will learn about much later. Father, but you must have known, or did you not? Did you choose not to know? A group of Middle Easterners about to get on the back of a camel of all animals, the camel being the animal they associate with us? Will they take us as camel jockeys? Haven't you heard? Haven't you heard? And don't ask me how I've heard, Father. Why would you put ourselves in this position? Isn't there a danger in that? And if not real danger, isn't there a danger in exposing us to too much public humiliation? For even if it isn't in their lips, it is in their eyes, and I swear I can read their eyes. I just hate camels, that's all, I tell him in the end, all I can think of saying. And just for a second, there's something scary I see in his eyes. There's nothing to hate, he says, it's just an animal, that's all, what is there to hate? I don't say anything, and then it's our turn. We ride the camel. My father behind us, clutching both me and my brother in front of me, all three of us silent as a blonde woman with a big smile, with eyes shielded behind big sunglasses, walks Scheherazade around the riding area. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of the imagination, it is not. I expect the ride to take an eternity, but it lasts the five or so minutes they advertise. It feels like five minutes on top of a camel in the sun against your father and your brother, nothing more or less. Then we're down and my mother and father get into a fight because she forgot to take a picture. And my father wonders how in the world she could when she has been so good about it all day. And then my brother has a fit by the ice cream stand, which is all out of a particular type of ice cream he wanted. And I put my hands over my ears to block him out. And he pushes me harder than I know he had in him. And I lose my balance and topple into a vat of cactus. The rest of our time is spent in the zoo's hospital where a kind old lady with tweezers plucks out the needles stuck in my skin one by one. My father is asking me if I'm in pain over her shoulder in Farsi and I don't answer him. My mother is outside entertaining my brother who is finally eating the ice cream he wanted, bought from another stand, a reward for his wrongdoing. And the old lady is trying to get me to speak too. She asks if I did anything fun. My father finally interjects. 
well, we took a camel ride. All those needles in me don't even affect me. I say nothing, I let him have it. The old lady chuckles. How brave of you, she says to me and just me. I look her straight in the eye, questioning. You fucking dune goons, she goes on. Why don't you go back to your country? My heart is pounding. Did she really say that? No. She said, how brave of you. I would have been nervous up there on a thing like that. I nod. How do I tell her I was, that I was so sick I could die? By the time the needles are out of me, I'm a grown woman, old even, old as the old lady herself. I won't be surprised except by the beautiful things in life, of which there are fewer than I would have thought. Love is hard, acceptance harder, belonging still hardest. Home is still nothing. Who has time for home and all its wondering about its wondrous whereabouts? That orange and lavender day spent among animals is nothing, just a day. As he would say, what is there to hate? That's that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I know it's so weird not to have like. It's really weird to yeah <laughs> not to hear people. But cheers. Thank you. I know. <laughs> um, Thank so you we start guys. talking now. Yeah, I'm actually so shocked because I was so worried about like I don't know these Zoom things are all new for us and so you don't yeah, you yeah. Know, more people end up being at the Zoom events than you would in like a little bookstore. So it's actually so great in a way. How do you know who's here? Can you, you can see the little participants thing? And there's like oh my god, you know, there's like, ninety three people. Oh yeah, wow, hi guys. Hi. Oh, <laughs> Marchisa, I love this book. This was such balm to my soul that I didn't know that I needed. It just it made me think so much about my childhood and about like I think now that a lot of experiences that you had. I, I had them, but I hadn't articulated them to myself. I think because it was easier to, people didn't know about Turkey, whereas Iran was like this, I think it was it was both easier, but also I, I just didn't have to think about it as much because it wasn't something that people were constantly thinking about. But when you read that, like just everything about it was so familiar. The, um, the In Turkish, they also say liver for my dear. It's <laughs> oh, really? It actually yeah. might be a Turkish word because we have a lot of Turkish words in Barcelona. Yeah. In, yeah. Is I it, wonder, Giyar. Yeah, Giyar, it's the same. Yeah, yeah. Giyar, it's the same word. Amazing. I love Giyar, that. my dear liver. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. And the thing about the camels, I just like, I remember when my parents got, um, they were in like a custody dispute and we had to talk to social workers and the social worker kept trying to talk to me about camels and I was like, what's the matter with this lady? And I just kind of like checked out and didn't really engage with it. But at the same time, like my grandfather, when he was a little kid, he used to ride from Ankara to the Salt Lake and back then conveying the salt, which was apparently done by camel. And he had all of this information about camels and how smart they were and how they would spit and what you would feed them, this special thing that was called camel dough. And I like, I didn't, I like my whole childhood, I was just like, how can I hear as little about these camels as possible? And then I'll be a happy person. Like, and now I wish I, I knew all those things, you know? <laughs> well, it's a traumatizing. <laughs> a few years ago, I was, um, I, I, my partner and I had gone to an Airbnb in like Oakland and it was like a very trendy, cute Airbnb and they had camel print bedding. Hmm. And I was suddenly like, oh my God, did they look me up? Did they know a Middle Eastern person was coming here? <laughs> I was like, of course not. It was like probably some trendy Urban Outfitters thing. But I was so mortified. I mean, I still, if someone mentions camels around me, I just am like, are they, you know, like- That's so are amazing. They trying to attack me? Or like there's certain foods I won't like eat, you know? There's, I have all these like hangups about it. Yeah. And how, how sad it is and how- all of the things that are that everyone has a hard time with when they're growing up, like all of the normal troubles of individuation and adolescence, like what you describe is like everyone has that, right? Their dad is making them do something they don't want to do and it's embarrassing. But now, like in your case, there's like a whole country associated with it. I, I was wondering, do you, huh, I don't even know what I want to ask because I have so many feelings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also, everyone, Everyone in Turkey is always dyeing their hair blonde. When I hang out with my relatives, they're like, oh, you're so natural. Like, it's like a statement if you have, if you're like of a certain social class and you don't dye your yeah. hair. Um, so I loved all they the stuff about They always say that about me, like, oh, they're like, she's simple. 
you know, yeah, 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 exactly. like a word for like, oh, she's not like plastic surgery or dyed hair. <laughs> yeah. Um, another of my favorite sentences is where you're working on Rodeo Drive and the lady looks down at you from her, what must have been her third or fourth nose and says, Persian girl, how did you end up here? It's so amazing. Yeah. There's an essay I have about the guy, um, some of you guys might know Bijan, who died in 2011. He was like the big designer and he had this giant yellow, bright yellow, like boutique on Rodeo Drive. And I mean, Bijan was like a big character in the 80s. He had all these ads with Bo Derek when she had cornrows, very problematic. And like, he loved Michael Jordan. He was just in a lot of ads. It's very 80s. And then he died in 2011. And I just felt I had to write about him, mainly because like, you know, he was such a symbol of Tarantulas. And the essay is called The King of Tarantulas. And I worked in my like late 20s, actually, in a, in a boutique across the street from it. And there were so many Iranians who would come to this like fancy handbag boutique and they would just like pity me for being a Rodeo Drive shop girl, which honestly, I was like, this is a good job. <laughs> like it actually, I was making like, not, you know, not a lot of money, but it was like a job. And that was the thing I kept realizing. I'm like, oh, like in the story of LA Iranians, to be a poor Iranian is, is seen as rare, even though the reality is that there's plenty of poor Iranians, but like, it's just a story that was like not um, visible, basically. That's another interesting thing about the book. Like everyone has sort of a monolithic idea of everyone else. Like everyone here has sort of a monolithic idea of Iran or like you describe, I also really identified with the thing of like the first time you go to New York when you're like a young person and you're like, oh, maybe this will be my people. And you feel kind of like out of place and like sort of negged by the people in New York. And then you go somewhere else and everyone's like, oh, you're so New York. Like, I totally yeah. remember that. And also being like, um, when you describe the, some of the conversations that you have with assignment editors and how they're like, um, the 30 something, oh, can you, can you work your Persian family into this? Or can you work the Iranian experience into that? And they clearly, it's, it's almost like, I get this feeling from talking to people like that, that they think that there's this kind of like well of stuff that you can just like dip into. And I feel like I had that idea for a long time and I sort of about Turkey and I associated it First of all, I so because I think part of it was, so my question eventually is going to be, to what extent did you feel like this and was it different for you because you actually grew up there and that was like your first language? But like, did you ever have any kind of delusion that there was sort of a monolithic Iranianness that you were trying to do justice to and somehow like failing to do? Because then there's this like amazing list of questions that you have in the last essay where you're like talking about getting different questions why do you say Iranian and not Persian? Why are you embarrassing us? Why are you not writing on subjects of a happier nature? Why are there so many jokes? What do you think of us? Are we good or bad? Are you good or bad? Why do you call us brown? Why do you not look more white? Why do you look so white? And it's like, you can't possibly answer all of it, right? And you're like trying. And then so many people tell you like, you're a representative of our country or you're a representative of this thing. Like how, how, do, how, I mean, you write about how you deal with that, but could you just talk about how you deal yeah, with that? Yeah, it's such a, I mean, the funny thing is I think I felt like an outsider in every, um, in every like group I've ever been associated with. I mean, I even, I feel that way a lot in the literary world too, in so many ways. Like I never feel comfortable basically anywhere I am. Um, and that's well, like, how would you recognize it if you did, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I actually feel like comfortable around like, like, honestly, like people like you, like other people, mm. like who are like immigrants or people of color or like, and who are nerds, mm. <laughs> you know, like the way we are. Yeah, totally. And, and I feel like, oh, they like, I just immediately feel like I understand them in a way. But for the most part, like so many of these groups, when I'm in LA, I feel very ill at ease. In lots of areas in New York, I feel that way. Um, you know, it's always very rare when I feel like I get it, but I think this is a really good trait for writers. I mean, to feel like an outsider all the time actually is a great thing for a writer because you're always on the outside looking in and it, like, and you can also play mind tricks with yourself to survive it. You can say like, oh, one day I'll write about this. Or like, if I look at it through writerly lens, like how can I exist in it? Being uncomfortable is a very good thing for a writer, you know? So I think like I'm constantly uncomfortable. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. The blessing is that I'm a writer. I don't know what I would do if I had another um, calling. I'd be very, very, like, just, like, not a functional person. But, um, yeah, so I think, that, I think that is a big thing. And I think that's the thing about this book that was really important for me is to talk about all the different identities. And, and like, just to say Iranian-American, like, there's so much, there's such a mosaic in just that term. 
So what is that? Whereas I don't even think this book would have been possible like 10 years ago. You totally. know, people had totally. such an idea of like what they really thought Iranians were. I mean, white people were always trying to tell me things like, oh, well, I know Iranians. Iranians are like this. And I'd be like, like, what? I don't even know what you're talking about. Or I do know what you're talking about and I'm embarrassed. I'm going to pretend I don't know what you're talking about because it's mm -hmm. horrible. So it's just like that familiarity that people would have in weird ways always kind of irked me. But I think like social media and just like more Iranians coming to the U.S. and more knowledge about like Iranian-American relations. I mean, the fact that in January, we almost just went to war again with Iran. It's kind of crazy. I mean, Iran's constantly in the news in this really hectic way. And so um, it's given me a lot of chances to like reconsider what identity means as an Iranian-American. I guess an another thing I was thinking, well, first of all, the thing that you said about feeling like an outsider and how that's a good thing for a writer. I mean, do you, I always think that that's what made me a writer. Is that, do you ever feel like that? Because like, yeah. you describe a lot also like where you're clearly speaking a different language from everyone else. And really there's no one who speaks all of the same languages that you do. There is a part like, when you're at school and you're trying to, and you're always very consciously choosing from these different vocabularies, like you just did in the Twilight Zone. And then there's a kind of heartbreaking little conversation that you do so well about um, when you go to college and you start taking these classes and everything is like Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Derrida, and then your mom calls and is like, um, so what are you studying in school? How are your grades? And you're like, mom, it's Sarah Lawrence. There's no grades. And well, but how did you do on your test? And then when your dad is like, well, what about math? And just the, like the impossibility of bridging that. And I feel like I spent a lot of my adolescence also trying to communicate between um, just different worlds that just didn't share the same language. And I wanted to have some, like I wanted to create some kind of narrative that would just like explain everything and sort of like validate my point of view. Is that a feeling that you had or that corresponded to anything that you had? Or how did yeah. you deal with that stress of like, well, I think like writers, so much of like what makes writers writers is they're trying to make sense of things. They're always trying to look for meaning and connections and they're always trying to like create this like continuity, this narrative, right? Yeah, that exactly. Your life makes sense. But the truth is like now that I'm in like my early 40s, like it actually makes less sense to me than ever. Like there is no way for me to weave it all. And now I think I'm just more comfortable with chaos. I'm not trying to like make it all make sense. I think mm -hmm. I've finally internalized that that old like, that old idea that like a writer just raises the questions. They don't have to solve yeah. problems. So that's like a very mature totally. thing that young writers learn and they're never really ready for it until they're much older. That you just have to raise the questions. You don't have to solve it. It's not those five paragraph yeah. essays that by like for conclusion, you solve world peace, right? Right, so, right. You know, I just feel like the messiness now is like a little bit more comfortable for me. And if someone can't understand where I'm coming from or is like criticizing, like who I am or just finds it confusing. I'm just like, whatever, who the fuck cares what you think? Like, <laughs> I, like I just don't care anymore. And honestly, like when I started reading your work, which was really, I mean, we, we really have to remember, you were one of, like, you know, now there's this whole thing of like the young staff writer, the New Yorker. I kind of think of you as the first young staff writer, the New Yorker. Like when you got uh, that gig, I, I totally remember. Cause I was like, oh my God, I really think she's Middle Eastern. And how every time someone Middle Eastern would do something amazing, I'd be like, Score, you know, and, and I think you were like such a baby when you write. Like you were I was so kind of a baby, yeah. Yeah, and and like and we're the, the same age. Yeah, but that was like such a long time. Ella, if you've been at the New York for a long, long time, time weirdly, like it, time you're ago. so young, but it's crazy. And and it was so exciting to me. And then I was watching all the articles you'd write in the New Yorker, and what I really like was wowed by was that you weren't. I didn't feel that you were like pigeonholed there all the time. Like you would write like stuff about Russian literature, you'd write about like depression, you'd write about like some Turkish mm -hmm. stuff, but then you'd write about these other things. And you had this kind of like roaming beat, but your voice was kind of the thing that carried all these pieces together. And I remember that was really like liberating for me because you were frankly like one of the only writers I knew who was able to do that and in such a venue like The New Yorker, um, you know, where I still think of all the young writers there now, like a lot of them are pretty confined to certain beats. Like we expect this person to write about this, this person to write about this. And like, I don't know, like I often think about like how you navigated that. Cause I think that allowed for like a lot of us to like expect some freedom for ourselves too. Oh, that's wonderful. What a nice thing to say. Thank you for saying that. But it's amazing. Um, like, did you 
to fight for that or was it just like somehow like how did you do that <laughs> I don't know I kind of wonder that too um it, it was a lot of a lot of struggle and a lot of suggesting things and people saying no. But I also think, I mean, so I'm right now, the book that I'm working on is a sequel about, a sequel to The Idiot. So it's about my second year at Harvard. <laughs> it's like really, sophomore it's kind of year. embarrassing. But, sorry? You should do a senior Yeah, it's sophomore year. So year. And then junior year and then senior year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw Ben Kunkel was like, oh, so it's going to be a tetralogy. And like in the last volume, you're going to be like, oh, did you get enough credits to graduate? And I was like, wow. Well. But um, I, I've been th like, I just keep thinking about the 90s and I, I don't know, and the, the movie Get Out and Trump's tax returns. And it just feels like we're all kind of stuck on this like unprocessed thing from the 90s. Or maybe I'm projecting and it's just me, who knows. But um, I, I also have been thinking about how much I, and how consciously I did this from an early age and how much it came from my mother also was this like, need to pursue legitimacy and like status and like if there was a Harvard like I was going to go to it like I wasn't you know so that people would have to listen to what I said and I was like what what is there now there's a New Yorker like I'm going to write for that and you know I'm going to get a PhD and I think there was this constant kind of persuading myself that I was going to jump through all of the hoops and somehow acquire some kind of like sheen of knowledge that I was going to use to get to do what I wanted to do almost before I had an idea of what I wanted to do, which I feel like I'm, I'm starting to get to do now. So I actually, I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of having my 20s like exploring period now that I'm sort of done jumping. And then sometimes I feel sad about it and I'm like, wait, is this a dream? Am I really 43? Like, when did this happen? Yeah. Like right before I wake up, I'll have a dream where I don't remember how old I am. And like, it's, it's always kind of nightmarish, but yeah, I, I better understand. late than never, right? Yeah, I think it's good to be like, like immature later. That's yeah. Cool. Do we do we go to audience questions? I have sort of a question about Edward Said. Oh my God. <laughs> I, well, I was just read, so I read. I think I read Culture and Imperialism at some point in college, and it made zero impression on me. And if anything, I felt kind of alienated by it because he would talk about like, oh, the West is so arrogant to want to impose these models of narrative on other people, and that the whole language that we have of like encyclopedias and the whole idea of translating that these people think that they're going to translate the quaint language of these regional places into the universal language of you know the French or English novel or whatever and then a problem that I had when I was writing for the New Yorker and I went to Turkey and I was living there for the first time as an adult I was I found myself trying to put the things that the Turkish people said into the language that I associated with like writing which is a language that I got from western forms which I think is for you too like you talk about Faulkner yeah. oh my god the Joan Didion was another bomb to my soul I <laughs> really yeah I find her I mean I of course I admire the skill and I've taught her yeah. too and you know, props and respect but right. like but there's something there that is not yeah it's not about hard she really feels oppositional to like middle eastern temperament for me somehow like you know, whereas like the Southern writers, I could kind of feel them in a different way, but like, I just like waspy, like New England, like patrician type stuff, mm -hmm. I can't. I, I can There's admire it, but I don't connect. Yeah. There's an aestheticization of the condition of being a woman, like I am on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I don't know if this, I might have a migraine, my hand is shaking as I hold the scotch and the cigarette that is just, I don't yeah. know. I feel like that got to me at an early age and had some kind of negative effect on my psyche. But yeah. do you ever feel like, as so, like, because like, insofar as we have a scene that we, like we feel comfortable in, we kind of got it through this kind, this mode of writing that's basically Western, and that it's you know, even if we don't fit in here, we fit in more here than I mean, whatever, whoever gave us a voice, that was American people. Like, do you yeah. ever feel conflicted about that, or and do you feel conflicted with your parents, like writing about your parents? Because that's another big issue for me. Yeah, it is. Well, I mean, my parents have luckily just, they're sort of just used to it and they think whatever. So it's not really about permission, but it is a little bit weird because it's like now I'm like their age when I was writing about them as characters. Yeah, so yeah. I can think more from their end now than I did when I was in my 20s. Um, totally. But then the thing about like distance, yeah. I think, is really interesting. Like, I do think you're right. Like, I think when people say I'm also a very American writer, I get insulted by that, but it's also mm -hmm. very true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like, I'm actually like thinking about leaving America like for a very long time, like very long time. 
and like going back to like Asia and I don't know where in Asia, but somewhere because I don't want to be in Europe either. Um, but I just want to leave the West. Oh, cool. for a while. What? <laughs> yeah, surprise. Oh, <laughs> but no, it's kind of a big deal right now for me. It's like a big thing. But I, I think that that will let me understand being American. Like, you know when you read about Baldwin going to Paris, like, yeah, totally. he had to do that to understand who he was as an American, and I've gotten to a point where, like, I relate when he talks about this, like, like, America's just gotten so frustrating, and every morning mm -hmm. I have, I'm full of hatred for, like, the American experience, I'm just so angry, and I'm so mad at Trump, and I'm just so horrified at what's happening, and, and, and the whole coronavirus thing has just been such a mess here that I just feel like mm -hmm. I can't carry that much anger, like, it's just mm -hmm. not for me and so I think I need to like make some radical change and then I could be like okay well maybe America like you know like I can kind of understand like you can't pretend like everywhere is perfect no place is perfect as long as there's human beings right um but I just think I need a little bit of like I gotta get out of here for a while I think oh that would be so awesome a book about being American that you wrote from somewhere else that would be so yeah. cool yeah I think so did you read Susie Hansen's book it was like um yes. I really yeah. like that book. Amazing. Too. She's brilliant. She's, yeah, yeah. She's fantastic. So I, I think, I, like, that'll be, I didn't want to ever be an immigrant again, but I think that, like, I, I probably have to be. And in some weird way, I don't know, this has also been, like, liberating, even though it sounds sad. Like, I feel like I've, I'm kind of, like, a failure in America. <laughs> now that I'm, like, about to be 43, I'm, like, I failed somehow. Like, I'm still, like, constantly in debt and I can't survive ever like you know it's always a struggle you're not a failure you're a writer you're an artist uh, that's true but it's just that's, like nothing that's what it is like, we're all in debt <laughs> it's so messy it's so bad but it's like I just feel like but it's liberating also because I you know that yeah. stuff you know, like Harvard New Yorker and all that like I had a I had a version of that and like I just don't feel like any of that ambition anymore and I would just mm -hmm. rather be like okay well I didn't achieve the things that people thought I would achieve like I can't hold down a relationship. I can't like hold down like a real job, whatever. Like, but it's like, okay, it's fine. Yeah, I, I yeah, know. sometimes I just, yeah. I feel like it's like, never let me go. Like we went to school and we thought that we were being trained to be like special and to be, right. and, so, and then but it turns out that we were all just being bred for our organs to be harvested. <laughs> yeah. so I don't, I, I don't really take it personally. I just kind of feel like it's everyone, but like, yeah, if you measure it by money, then it, then it sucks, but. Right. And it's like my grandmothers were like illiterate. They had kids by the time they were 14. And like they were the most amazing people I'd ever met in my life. And like they would just like stare at me when I would do all this like ambition talk about like how yeah. I would be to write the New York Times and like live in New York and all this stuff. And they would just like be like, okay. But I like, remember trying I to make my grandma keep a diary, which in <laughs> Turkey is like a memory notebook. And she was like, you keep your memory notebook. <laughs> like it was so clearly like something that she despised. She's like, what do I have to, I'm going to live and I'm going to die. It might happen tomorrow. <laughs> I love older Middle Eastern women. They're the best. Yeah, I know. But it's, I think it's good. I want to become like them. Like I just want to just be like, I've seen it all. I don't fucking care. Let me Okay, just... you and I are going to find some country and then we're going to go set up yeah. a shop there and become fabulous Middle Eastern American yeah. ladies. I'm doing the research. <laughs> I'll, I'll okay. Tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Do we open this up to the audience? Yes, we actually we have a couple questions already. Um, so I think we only have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so oh, I'm no, just going to go. Why do we, we have to stop exactly? Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're totally fine. It was such a wonderful conversation. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the first one is from Aria. Um, and her question is, was it difficult finding magazines or websites interested in your narrative as an Iranian immigrant? I'm Iranian, Amer I'm an, excuse me. I'm an Iranian-American writer, and whenever I pitch essays about Iran or growing up as a first-generation Iranian, they rarely, they're mm -hmm. rarely met enthusiastically. They're rarely what? What's the last part? They're rarely met enthusiastically. Oh, yeah. Well, part of it is, like, people like me have screwed it up for you because they've read, mm -hmm. like, our essays, and, like, they're like, oh, well, you know, they read, they already wrote those essays, which is so annoying and so stupid because how many different essays are there on the same, like, white experience that you read over and over and over and over again? So that's, like, complete bullshit. And, well, when I was publishing these essays, honestly, there weren't a ton of Iranian American essays. There were there were a few, but they were doing very different things. And I went, they were like boomers and I'm Gen X mm -hmm. and they were very much writing from the perspective of like 
you know, kind of like richer, older ladies who'd left during the revolution. And it was like, they were like, kind of like angsty moms kind of. And I just have this whole other thing of being like a fuck up, like 20 something who's kind of messy and a little bit New York and crazy. And so there wasn't really someone who was doing my thing. So I would just encourage you, because I believe everyone is obviously unique, right? If you could kind of find a way to show your unique angle on this, even if it's like angling yourself in opposition to me or writers like me and being like, you know, like, you know, I'm familiar with the body of Iranian American essays, but here's my story. I grew up in, you know, Arkansas and in and, and blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, offering your unique angle on this will let an editor at a mainstream publication know that like you're, you're going to bring something new to this. Um, it's really annoying that we have that bur we have to have that burden of like showing our uniqueness when not, whatever. Like I said, there's so much of the same story with white American stuff, but I think that that could be a thing. Um, but I do think also, in some ways, it is easier this these days because you have a lot of really smart people of color who are editors at a lot of publications. There's been a lot of really good hires and young hires, and so you're seeing more, you know, young people of color who have great politics who are in positions of power. And I think you're only going to see more of that, hopefully. And so I think you're going to have good opportunities, but you just got to kind of look at like outside the box. I mean, some of my favorite essays in this collection are not just the New York Times essays. I mean, they're essays that were in really weird publications that no one's ever heard of. So you have to also think outside the box and think like, who will provide me with the best like published piece or best clip, you know? Um, and email me, I can ask, I can think with you. All right, so I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I'm just gonna read this one out as well. Um, do you have any stories to share of when or how you began to reject the idea of tokenization and monolithic representations of Iranian or Turkish people in America? Mm -hmm. I guess this is for both of you. Um, what is that process like? Or no, sorry, I totally read that wrong. Um, was it a process that took a long time, or are there moments where it clicked? Ella, why don't you start that? That's a good... That's a good oh, that's a really good question. Yeah. Tokenization, I feel like, you know, maybe at four o'clock today, I started to feel angry about tokenization. I was really, like, late to understand tokenization. I drank a lot of Kool-Aid. Um, I think a lot of stuff... Actually, Me Too changed a lot of how I thought about women's stories. I think because, you know, the way that you wrote about blonde people in this book, Porch, you said, it really reminded me of a lot of the stories that I heard about women having problems, I just associated with them being blonde and having this kind of like personality that I like blamed them for the stuff happening to them without realizing <laughs> that that was what I was doing. And it just feels like extremely recent in my life that I'm realizing like, wait, everyone has a body and like, it determines all of this like shit that falls on your head from like the minute you come out the gate. and that like that's what we're all living with and struggling with and kind of pretending doesn't exist. Um, I think with the, mo like for me with the monolithic, there isn't a monolithic Turkish identity. That I started to realize when I was traveling to Turkey as, a, um, as an adult for the first time, which I started doing in college. I went and it was, you know, sort of right at the beginning of the Erdogan time and my, my parents are very, they're like Kemalist, secularist, hardcore, um, in Turkish Republicans and I you know that was the idea of Turkey that I had and that was all that I saw and I did not realize that there was this like populist religious movement that then once it it came to power then said that it had been suppressed all the time which there's still some kind of like conversation about about that but but yeah when I when I got to Turkey and I just saw how many people it and then of course I felt so foolish for like what I thought every Turkish person was like my parents because my parents are the two Turkish people but then when I just started to see all the different kinds of views and the extent to which I don't know and the and, and the extent to which Turkey had kind of internalized uh, the Turkish left and the Turkish intelligentsia um, how how critical they were of people like my parents and also how critical, how, how much they had internalized the kind of ideas from Said about Orientalism and how, you know, people would tell me that I was being an Orientalist. And at first that was really hard for me to hear. And I, you know, I couldn't hear it. And then I started to think about it. And now I think it's super interesting. Um, so yeah, part of it is also getting to a place of security where like you, 
it's, it's almost like a luxury and a privilege to be able to stop and take, like the thing that you said about not having to come up with an answer for everything, like that's sort of a sign of enlightenment. And it's also a sign that you're not struggling, you're not struggling to survive to the extent that like every little question might just like annihilate your being forever, which is something that I've really enjoyed about life past 40. So I guess I would say if I had to put a date on it, I would say, wait, wait till you're 40 and everything gets kind of I think that's so true. I think it really helps. Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe we're a type of person, but I think it definitely for a lot of people comes later in life. Mm -hmm. and so it, it really has been easier for me later in life. Um, I mean, it used to be that like the way editors would write me their reactions to certain things I would pitch or the conversations they'd have that were so clearly like xenophobic underneath it all. Like that would just destroy me for like weeks. Like I would be so shattered. I would like, you know, just like be destroying myself for weeks. Like I ended up with like drug problems and drinking problems from just like things like that, you know, because my identity was so fragile in a way and I don't mm. feel that way anymore. Um, and it's just like, I think then it became, when, one trick I, I came up with was to make that my subject. Like mm -hmm. to be at peace with the fact that tokenization will happen and that, you know, fetishization and all that crap will always happen, you know, as long as there's a concept of West and East and all that. And, you know, and I became interested not just by, by with Orientalist thinking, but also like Occidentalist thinking, yeah. fascinating too. Yeah. Um, and so I just started to think about how we other everything, right? And, and what that really means and how my own people have othered. I mean, we have othered people in like Turkish people. I mean, Iranians are brutal about everyone around them, you know? And so I just started to make that myself. All subject. they do in Turkey is cry and say, we're going to become like Iran, and then they cry. It's like, what, Iranians are horrible. I mean, they make like Turkish jokes. It's like so inappropriate. Sure they do. Oh, like, sure no, they do. It's really bad. It's like not okay. I mean, Iranians are really out of control. They're very much like Americans in a lot of ways in the Middle East. Like they have that identity that they just are, they think they're the boss kind of. Um, but the joke's a little bit on them at times. But then... I don't know. So I just, I just made this kind of my subject. So I decide not to think like good or bad. That's the best advice. Make it your subject. Like, I feel like the, the bad thing is when you think like, oh, I should already have an idea. And you start to feel ashamed and like, I should already have resolved this before I start writing. And then when you're like, oh wait, no, this is the thing that I can actually, and it brings this like expansiveness and, and humor that you have. I, yeah. Yeah, as long as it's is... your subject, you have a distance, it goes back to the outside. Yeah. As long as you can put a distance between yourself and the thing that you're like writing about, then you're safe and there's an armor and a shield. And if only I could wear a version of that in my personal life, you know, if mm -hmm. I knew how to do that, I would be a much happier, healthier person. But it's like a real gift for writers, I think, like to be able to play those games with their interests. You know, I've been undercover for a lot of like, I had a few different in journalism gigs where I actually went undercover and I felt the happiest I've ever been when I was actually undercover on assignment in, in dangerous places, sometimes for months. But when, as long as I was undercover, I felt like immortal, you know? I, I was like around like murderers in like highly dangerous, scary places. But like if, I, if it was for an assignment, then I could just do it. I could totally do it and yeah. I felt protected by the, by the writing somehow. That's amazing.